Well, I don't want to be rude, but at the same time, I want to get my point across that, Amen. you know, people believe that God is this person laying in the clover somewhere. <laughs> Dude, he's a warrior God. He, he's, he's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He destroys his enemies. He's not... Those who love him, he's very compassionate and easy going on. Thank you, God, for that. Yes. And I'm not making excuses. I just thought uh, my wife was, you know, thought I should maybe ask y'all. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't retract anything. I just want to make sure that you're not offended too much. We'll keep we'll keep the offense up by the red line, okay? But we try not to cross. <laughs> Holy Ghost. Now, you see, I got my shoes on, right? Tennis shoes. These are my running shoes. Y'all don't know this. I'm 65. Yeah. Woohoo! And uh, in the last five years, I have run 30 marathons. Seven of which are what's called ultras. That means it's wow. it's more than 26.2. Wow. And my boys, bless them, they just signed me up for a 50 miler. <laughs> they figured I could probably do it. Yeah, you can. You can do it. And they figured right. <laughs> so I expect to see every one of you out there with me. <laughs> Uh, uh, I have to make apologies for my health because it, it's good. I have to make apologies for my marriage because it's good. I have to make apologies for my kids because they're awesome. They love God. I have to make apologies for my grandkids because they love Jesus as well. So I don't know what the problem is. Do you understand? I don't get it. Different decisions early on make for good life later on. Because it does matter. It does matter. So I don't know. I might make myself a little vulnerable for about five minutes. <laughs> so, does anybody have a question pertaining to what I do for a living? Uh, th that's all right. It's, if you do, I will take a, one question. Anybody want to have a question? No? Are you serious? What is it, baby? I would like a crash course. Okay. Yep, that's a good question. First of all, you seek God. Second, you seek God. Third, you seek God. There's your crash course. Now, and I'm not being cute. Because when I was, I was down in Melbourne and they were trying to get me to release the energy to raise the dead in Australia. Do y'all know Ben Fitzgerald? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, he's an amazing fellow. He's, he's uh, I like him. Um, yeah. Uh, Awaken Europe is his deal. And uh, he, he brought me, he and some other church, they brought me down to Australia and my wife and I because they wanted to release the energy of dead raising in their works in Australia. And so we're sitting up, they did this thing where we're, they're asking questions. And my question was similar to this one. But it was, what, what would you suggest are the top three things that made you successful in God? I said, oh, I got that. That's easy. <laughs> Number one, Jesus. <laughs> Number two, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Number three, Jesus. Jesus. I have not taken an off day from prayer. I don't know how long it's been. Lots of years. I might sleep 
30 minutes or an hour later in a day, but it always starts out with prayer. Depending on my schedule dictates how many hours, not minutes, hours. I fast seven months out of every year. Uh, most of you ultra grace people believe that you don't have to do anything but float along and eat pizza and drink beer. <laughs> That's exactly why you have nothing and can do nothing. But you did have a good beer and a good pizza. And I wish I would have been with you when you did it. But I don't do that. So... If you will seek God, I'm not telling you it's by works. I, am a not, I don't believe in works. But I believe in obedience. I took the Bible apart in Genesis all the way to Revelations. I actually took every book, every chapter, and I, and I sorted it out. I put it in your see my notebook. I still have them. And I took all these men that were successful in what we believe success is. Moving with God, doing things with God, obedience to God, and him coming on their behalf and from changing nations to raising the dead. So, so I took those people, uh, the whole, note, no, whole notebook was for one book. And so... I figured out the thread. There are threads that are in the Old Testament as well in the New. They, that runs all the way through history of what God wanted to do and did in all generations. And so, uh, so I took studied that right. And when I come to my final conclusion, there were four men that I wanted to be like Amen. Moses. Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus. And so I took those four men and I studied them, I scrutinized them, I combed through them, what history says about them, what the Bible says about them, what theology, what all the books. My daddy was a, was a doctor. He had a doctorate in theology, so I have resources. I have libraries of resources that were his. So I took the, all these things and I hunted through the great men of time who studied extensively and I studied them and what they said about these people. And I come to this conclusion. All of those people I just named to you prayed and fasted and the results they got are greater than any man ever that we have history of. And I'm sure there were more because Jesus said we'll do more. So somebody did. It may not be recorded, but somebody's done that. So, uh, so I, I went down through there and found out that prayer and fasting is, a, is one of those cords that runs all the way through the Old and New Covenants. And that dead raising is also one of those cords that was in both covenants. So I, I one day, the li I had to uh, list several pages of the miracles of the whole Bible in front of me. And I'm looking at it, and I chose dead raising. Amen. I just put my hand on it and told my wife, we'll do this one. <laughs> it doesn't seem very spiritual. Uh, and it may not have been, but it's turned out to be quite spiritual because there's a movement of people wanting to seek God for this kind of engaging power. Yes. And I'm part of that. And uh, um, so I, I started out where I thought five days of fasting were an eternity and I would never make it through. Um, and uh, prayer for 30 minutes was, oh, it was hostile to me. <laughs> and now I can, there's some days I can go sit in my chair when I start worshiping. I don't even know time went by and it could, and I'll get up and look and it'll be four or five in the afternoon from four in the morning. I never even know it goes by. It's, it just gets so lost in his goodness. And it can, it can be considered a work because I'm quite uh, aggressive about teaching the need for it and people think I'm legalistic. Think what you want. 
with, think, with your thinking and your criticism, you just sit there. You're not going to raise the dead. You're just, you're just, you're just, you're just a mad little elf. You have to seek God, whatever that looks like. I, 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 I know for me what it looks like, and I'm very aggressive about it. Uh, listen, the, I guess the best thing I do is I'll, because I, when you're in my home, you're getting up when I get up. And I'm early. I'm the guy. I'm the one. I take a shofar. Whatever time I get up, four in the morning, whether it's, it doesn't matter, four, four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, I got this big shofar from Mount Horeb in Israel that was given to me from one of the families over there. And I walk outside, I have this big veranda, and I blow to the north, south, east, and west every morning. I wake everybody up. And then I, but I don't go and get them out of bed and kicking and screaming and spitting. I don't do that. I, but I blow the horn and the ones that want to come, come. And some of them feel obligated it's for the wrong reasons and that. But that's not my problem. It's my house. And as for me and my house, we will seek the Lord. We will trust him. And it, you don't have to be in my house. You're welcome. The gate is that way. <laughs> but as for us, my wife and I, I don't know, it's been like 40 years of diligence. Uh, I don't miss. And so uh, I'm very diligent with my running and my workout, my physical, because my health is amazing. And so I use... Uh, because I really enjoy my health so but what comes before my workout is my prayer so that's first and then my body my physical workout which my Bible runs the whole time I work out whatever how long that is um, so my suggestion is start now and stay don't ever give up on, on pray, pray, seek. Because when I lay down on the floor, it, w one of the greatest values I have, is, you saw my granddaughter, you saw how she is toward us. Uh, she's been raised in the glory. She, she knows nothing else. And, uh, and she can raise the dead. This girl, she don't even know. And, and, and it's awesome. But when I lay down on the floor in my office, one of the greatest things, all of a sudden, I'll feel a little bitty hand. And it'll grab my finger. And then another one and another one. And then when I get ready to get up, there'll be 10 or 15 of our missionary kids. They're holding my fingers and they're just looking at me. <laughs> and I let them. I have to teach them. And the way you teach them is on your face. It's not out of a book. It's out of mercy. So, that's your answer. And it's continual. It's, uh, it's, it's not, it's a habit. It's, 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 I'm going to do it. It doesn't matter what it views, how you view it. It may be legalistic. But when somebody, like I've had women walk in service with me in, my, in our work in Mexico carrying a blanket and they dump the blanket and it's heavy. I'm thinking mangoes or oranges. And I open it up and there's a dead baby in there frozen, been dead so long. She's been holding that baby waiting on me to get there. Could be a day or two days. Jesus. The trust that they have for me. That I'm going to be in God. See, most of you sitting here don't have that kind of responsibility on your life. And so it lets you vacillate. lets you move around and think whatever you want and do whatever you want. But I don't, I don't have that option. I am stuck and have no way out of the power of God. 
But I put myself in that position. And it works. And when you see these little babies in them blankets and you call up a few elders and we touch them and an hour or two, three, later, four or five, later, all of a sudden a little leg will just stick up and, and they take that breath and when they come back to life. It's very encouraging. Yeah. Shota Baba. So I don't want to be dogmatic, even though I am that. I don't want to be pushy, even though I'm a bulldozer. <laughs> I will move everything in my path to get to heaven. And I have buried my friends and it's a horrendous thing that this causes. But the awesomeness of the life is wonderful. So uh, my opinion in God is that it's worth it overall. The long distance haul of life. Short term, if you're only going to do it, don't start it. Just go make money. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry and die. Just be that way. Wow. Serious. Don't be in and out. Be in or be out. Because you're miserable when you're in and out. And I'm not. You see me? Do I look? I'm not miserable. I'm blessed. You see me? <laughs> this. You understand? I go to King's Palaces. I was, I was in uh, Malawi not long ago in Africa. And they brought me, it was an entourage. It was like 40 vehicles, right? I didn't know what we were doing. Look at me. See how I'm dressed? You know, and I'm preaching to 10,000 people in the stadium. And I go rolling up in, there's this mansion. I mean, this thing is amazing, right? And, and they bring me, and these people took me, and they put me in this chair. And I know it's the honored chair, and I know all that. And I'm sitting there, and this woman comes, and she kneels beside me, and she's taking care of me and making sure that things are proper and she's telling me the customs of the nation and doing all this stuff which is awesome right you know who the lady was on her knees she was the vice president of the nation wow. you know that's a so you, you need to understand that these gifts God put on us bring us before kings. Presidents. Man, you, uh, I could bore you with such things. It's great what happens. And I just go with it. Da, 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 da. Does that answer your question? <laughs> That's enough. I gave you your one shot and gave you a partial answer. That's what you get. <laughs> Thanks for having. No, uh, one question. What about testimony? <sighs> okay. Real fast. This morning we wanted apply what you've been teaching us so we were out waiting to get in and a man uh, passed out on the train oh so uh, nice. an ambulance came and, he, and they looked like they were Hindu so I crossed the street and we had been ministering to everybody passing back and forth awesome and, um, I told the man I said you shall live and not die Jesus you proclaim the works of the Lord Jesus and little girl don't be afraid Jesus is here hallelujah wanted you to know who is coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Holy. Okay. I'm not the long goodbye type of person. There's people you get around and they tell you goodbye like 14 times. So. I'll see y'all. So that's it. Now leave me alone. I got to go get Miss Hogan. We have to travel. Okay. If you will, go to, where, where, where was we at? Matthew yesterday. Will you turn back over there, please? Matthew 16 and uh, some verse. 
Uh, Matthew 16, 16. You there? Holy Ghost. I bless you. I bless you. I, I have decided to tell you two stories if I have time. Uh, I, I, and I, but I want to do a couple of verses as well. We was here last night in 16, uh, Matthew 16. And, and I bless you. I, I appreciate the way y'all have taken care of us, the hospitality. Uh, I planned this for my granddaughter. Uh, because my son's doing his 25th anniversary and they're in Europe and they're waiting on me to get back because we have a, some more conferences. When I leave here, I do another conference and phew, I got to go back to Europe. And uh, so we got the girl and uh, she is so blessed. And I just want to thank y'all for, for being nice to my granddaughter because that's probably healthy for you. <laughs> it is actually you touch us for good God touches you for good I am a favorite son so it does matter Holy Ghost now in Matthew 16 16 it says Jesus says uh well, he actually, he asked a question earlier. Uh, Peter says, you are the Christ. You have to keep that focused. Uh, there are energies around us that are very detrimental, very dangerous. Most of you live in an environment where it, you know of its existence, but you don't see it much. Some of you, I, I met some while ago that are in a, in a neighborhood where the Crips and the Bloods are fighting. And, and important people are dying and getting shot. And you don't know this. I, we were, I was praying with them while ago. The, the pastor got shot just two, two days ago, was it? Three days ago. And, and this is who comes to me. Do, do you understand that? My life, every day I deal with this. Every day. My phone rings at the office every day, three to five times from somewhere in the world. People wanting to give me big money to fly and help try to raise their people from the dead. So, this is important that we keep focused. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need to pray every day. We need to set a schedule and stick to it. We need to be diligent. We need to be faithful. We need, we need to be the one people look at when they, when they start writing a definition of faithfulness. They need to look at you. Come on. And so uh, um, there's a couple of stories here. Jesus is the son of the living God. That's what Peter said. I, I believe that. I believe that. Jesus is king. Yeah. Uh, then Jesus answered, yep, here you're blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied. Your uh, flesh and blood didn't reveal that. You're, but my father, say it with me, father, father. reveal to us reveal. your son Jesus. son Jesus. We need the revelation of who he truly is. Say it. Listen, when he's coming on that white horse with that sword in his hand, you think he's coming here to put you in a hammock and rock you and give you lemonade? Dude, what do you think he's coming for? He's coming for war. He is not some little lamb or some little baby you stick out on the lawn, a little plastic thing made in China. What's wrong with you? That is not who Jesus is. He's... Has a sword in his hand and fire in his eyes. That's who he is. All right, so reveal Jesus to us, Father. I tell you, Peter, uh, the, the rock, the gates of hell will not prevail. The powers of the infernal region shall not overpower the church of the living God. Or or be strong in its detriment or hold out against it. I tell you, eventually we win. Okay. Right. 
I'm, I'm the guy that likes to go to places that are impossible. <laughs> there, there's a place, uh, there's several places in our work. We have like 15 sections in our work, in our central work in Mexico. And we have other works as well. But the big work that I was so involved in for the whole time is there's areas, unreached people, tribes, there's, and it's held by either guerrillas or cartels. And some of them are vast. They could be anywhere from 50 villages to, to 500. And, and what most of you believe in is a, is a Burger King God. God <laughs> Well, you roll up in there, you don't care what's in the meat, you don't care what's in the bread, you don't care what they did to the mayonnaise. You just want it done your way in less than five minutes. And that mentality has come into the church. Let me go ahead and tell you that's a devil. Okay. Uh, a number of years ago, I'm going to tell you this because I want to. It's very dangerous, but it's awesome at the same time. About 30 years ago, I, I'm still a kid in those days. And much energy. You got the calm down, tone down, old man version. <laughs> and that's good for you. Otherwise, when I was younger, I'd have just come in here, lit a match to the place, burn it down, and left. <laughs> it's true statement. <laughs> now I pick my fires. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, I was told about this area of about, it was probably 200 villages, probably. It's quite a vast area. Several mountain valleys involved in this thing. No gospel. Bloodshed. Risk is 100%. You go there, you won't come back. So I heard about it. I felt like, I felt inside like, I should go. <laughs> I felt like they were trying to challenge me by, by this knowledge getting to me was like hell saying, bring it. <laughs> so when I heard it and I thought about it, I went back to my office where I pray and I was thinking about it. I thought, heaven is hell taunting me. So I stood up and I walked outside with my shofar and I blew the shofar toward the direction where this place was. And I spoke to the principality. I said, you know me. I'm coming. That's it. Now, because I did that. See, your world is not the same. First of all, you want to pray and fast for 30 years to see if it's God's will. <laughs> to, to even leave the United States. You say you're not slaves. But you are chained to your environment and your cul-de-sac or your apartment building. You are imprisoned in your own environment. So, I'm here to help you with that. <laughs> Let me say this to you. I won't. I believe if you're going to have a baby, you take care of a baby. And when people get saved, they're babies in, in the Lord. And you take care of them. That's a process of the rest of my life. 
So if I blow, if I blew my shofar, I announced that we're coming. There now it's for it's for the rest of my life. The outcome is not even relevant. See, in your world, you're success driven. In my world, I'm God driven. To be obedient. And it looks different sometimes than other times. But that's not the value. It's the obedience that's the value. And so I go in there and I begin to prepare uh, prep, the preparations. Preparations means I sit on the floor for 30 days and ask God to tell me uh, exactly how to do this. And for 30 days, I sat and waited and nothing came. That just means it's okay to go. I don't need a green light. It's been given to me when Jesus said four times, go ye and preach the gospel. You believe he said, sit ye till I send an angel and write on the wall. And that happened one time in the history of humanity. So, so there's things we disagree on. And of course you're wrong. And so, uh, uh, <laughs> so I went and gathered up some elders in this area, in this environment, close by. I said, God, God wants me to go. They said, how'd you know? Well, I heard about it. <laughs> and, and they all look at each other like you would if you wasn't scared I'd fuss at you. You just look at each other. He's loony. Truth is, I'm not the loony one. Come on. That's right. I am a son. And so, uh, I said, I'm going. And I'd be great if you went with me. But like you found out when I came to your area the first time, I absolutely do not need you. Amen. I don't need you condoning. I don't need your vote. I need the Holy Ghost and fire. And I know y'all live on a different scale than I do. That's why I can do it and you can't. Why do I go to Miss Heidi's? Why do I hang out with them? It's because she does similar things that we do. Their work is much larger than ours. That's not the value. The value is the power of God. Yes. You have to understand what I just said to you. Okay. And so, uh, uh, to the man, they said, when do you want to do this? I said, and I gave him a date. I said, I'm going out there. And I'll be out there three days. We'll, we'll be sleeping on the ground. We'll be sleeping in caves. We'll be sleeping in cornfields. And we will get them saved. And so we went. And there, this area is treacherous. It's uh, idolatry, witchcraft. It's, it's steeped in um, three millenniums of demon worship. And so uh, you, 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 there's no describing it to you what it feels like when you, when you walk on a, on a piece of dirt that's never had a human that walked on it that said Jesus is king. Wow. Th th this is what I live for. Uh, I like that. See, I'm what y'all call a pioneer lifer missionary. That's the term y'all use on people like me. And I don't understand it. I'm just an obedient guy that does what God says. I don't know your terminology, but I do know this. I'm right. Your terminology sucks. <laughs> tell us. Tell us. And so, and okay, I'll back up a little. That might have been a little heavy for you. I, no, no, no. Waking us. Waking us. Waking us. Be yourself. 
Because I've watched, I've got several years myself of history of y'all here in New York. I lived in upstate. I lived in Fredonia and in Chautauqua over there by Buffalo for over a year. I started, I came here, God spoke to me and I flew into LaGuardia and I knew no one. No one. I land, nowhere to go. I picked up my suitcase, look up, there's two men approached me. Did God send you here? I said, he did. Yeah, the angel of the Lord came and told us he was coming. So I got to start a, uh, a church in Queens and Brooklyn. Nice, huh? Of course, I was on stage with David Wilkerson the first time he, when he came back to the streets. That was before many of you were even born. So I'm not new to this zone, and but the the things you've suffered, the, the atrocities, the the problems that goes on, and all of this, I've watched you. You're pretty resilient. I just need you to turn that toward the Holy Ghost. I don't need you to sit around and wait. I need you to be the aggressor. I need you to be the one who bows and calls down the power and the glory. I need you to be the one who will step into these situations and live anyway. Because it's hard. And I'm sorry. And so, uh, so I bless you, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. I bless you, Pennsylvania and Maryland, and Delaware, and on and on. So we went, went out there, and here's what happened to me. They got me, they put me, uh, tied me up with ropes, put me in jail. My three days of uh, ministry were spent laying face down in other people's feces. Seems like that's not what the deal was. Seems like the deal was, I'm supposed to go in there and this demon's supposed to back up and let me have the turf. So that started the battle. And most of you believe by listening to myself, Miss Heidi, uh, Bishop Garlington, and others that you won't, you don't want the 30 or 40 years it took to bring us to where we are now. You want the now instead of the suffering. Well, it ain't going to happen that way. There are no bastards in the kingdom of God. There are only sons. That's right. Now you hear me. And I am being a little bit serious with you. I'm, I'm leading you up to some pretty heavy stuff. <laughs> so, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Okay, so here I am, hog tied, laying in feces in a jail. That don't seem like I'm prevailing very much. I get out with guns and clubs. They beat us and they threaten us and they tell us, you come back, we will be not as lenient on you. And I looked him right in the face, spitting blood. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and go on record with you demons. Soon as I heal, I'll be back. Get your guns old. Because the chariots of the Lord are coming with me. Amen. So they brought us out to the edge of their territory, turned us loose. And we left. We planned another attack. We did it. We lost. A year goes by, no converts. Two years go by, no converts. I told you how I got invited. It's because I heard about it. See, most of you would have quit a long time ago. 
I don't understand that terminology, quit. I understand when. You hear me? I can scare you with how rough my life has been. I have been shot. I've been left for dead three times, thrown in a river. But I didn't die. I don't know how many times I've been beat, but I, I have scars from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet still today. I make my way back to Ms. Hogan. She <clears throat> takes me in. She bandages my wounds. She prays over me. God heals me. And then she looks at me. She says, you're fit for war. Now go. <laughs> you see why I like her, right? <laughs> I need her to heal me because I'm going to step into a Water that's too deep for me. It's got critters in it that hurt me. But that's who we are. We're sons of God. We fear nothing. Come on. And this is what it gets you. Hurt. Jesus knew where he was going. He knew the cross. He knew the, the weight of the cross. He knew the damage of the cross. But he didn't back away. My Bible says he enjoyed his suffering. That's one of the newer versions says that. So, I don't like that. Five years go by and they killed one of my pastors. Then seven years go by, they killed two more. Surely this can't be God. Look at the time. Look at the death. These are real people with families. And now I got widows and orphans to take care of. You don't know that part of us. I don't talk about it much. But true and undefiled religion before God is to take care of the widow and the orphan. So that's what we do. I, I pay their way, these children, all the way through university. You don't know that part. I'm not going to bore you with it. It's, it's pretty big. I'm going to tell you the fun story. The, the getting shot and dying stories. <laughs> And so they threw us out, and my brothers finally told me, David, we're not going back. We don't, we're, we've, we can't do it. And for me to say I can't is pretty hard. So I told him, I understand. Be blessed. But I kept going. Finally, we had a convert. And then another one, and another one, and... And then 27 years go by. And the other day, which was like last year sometime, I was at a conference out in that, this area. We own it now. We own every village. All of them. And so... I'm there and I'm, of course, happy. We've, the price we've paid for these souls is immense. You don't count the diesel and the manpower and the, the amount of food and hotels and sleepless nights. There are hundreds. Hundreds of nights sleeping in cornfields, running for your life. Y'all don't know that gospel. And that's why I feel like I'm being soft with you, but you feel like I'm manhandling you. It's the difference in the gospel that we serve. And I get to this place and there's hundreds of people. And the head pastor comes out. He's over like, I don't know, 50 of our churches. He comes out. He says, Brother David, there's somebody I want you to meet. I said, all right. So I roll up on these people. They're dignitaries. They're the municipal judge and mayors and all these people are there. Police, chief, everybody's there for the whole area. I introduced myself to them. Ah, you're the guy that's been shot and beat. I said, yes, that's me. Well, we want to thank you for not giving up on us. You have, what's this? Our permission to heal the sick in every house. 
Thank you. You know, I was being nice to them because we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> but you be nice. You be, be, at that point, you be political a little bit. And so they said, well, we did that. And they said, in a minute, we're going to bring them in. They, we, want, we want to feed them with you. And I said, all right, it's fine. So we go inside this hall they have prepared. It's, they've killed two cows and five hogs. And so we're, you know, the feast is on. Uh, there, there's plenty. God's gospel brings peace and prosperity. It may take a generation, but it'll win. Eventually. And so I'm in there and there's, there's dozens of these matriarchs. You understand matriarchs? See, where I live, the family structure is still intact. And there's either a man or a woman in charge of the whole family. And it could be hundreds of people. And these matriarchs are all sitting there with these little baskets and these little hand uh, crocheted things and these... Uh, and they're sitting there with this food and they're waiting on me. Now I have to eat a little bit of every, everybody's food. And it's a lot. So I sit down by the pastor on the end of the thing there. And, and some people were placed and pastors and that and the elders. And so these women come, they make their, they grow their own coffee. They pick it, they roast it, they grind it, they do everything, and they believe all of them have, the, they each one, like you, believe you found the best coffee. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing. I hate that stuff. <laughs> but I drink, when I'm with them, I'll drink 10 cups a day, probably. <laughs> and that's fine, it doesn't matter. My preferences are not the value, the value is who Jesus is. <laughs> Should I say that again? See, your personal opinions and preferences are not, is not who God is. It's who you are. Who people have told you you are. But who God is, is not the same. And who you are in God is not the same as that person. And so, um, I sit there and these little matriarchs, these people are important in their village. They come up and they undo their little thing and they'll fix me this food and they'll sit there and watch me. And I have to, I have to take and drink some of their coffee and eat some, whatever it is they made. Whether it's bread or moly or atoli or it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, different foods. And so then I, I eat a little bit and then I, I move it and another one comes and another one. But there's one sitting over there. This lady, I don't know how old she is, but she's probably 14 or 15 million years old. <laughs> she definitely walked with the dinosaurs. <sighs> she is just bizarrely old. And, and, and the thing is, in Indian culture, it, in the, in the, when you're actually in tribal Villages where I live, you don't, women don't do this. They don't look me directly in the eyes. As soon as my glance comes around, the eyes go down. And it's their culture. It's who, but this one, I don't know, it might have been 15 million. <laughs> she's sitting over there and, and, and she's got nothing left. I mean, she's just a bone in her skin. And she's just sitting there, wrinkles, oh my God, wrinkles have wrinkles who have wrinkles. I mean, she's, she's so old. And I noticed her gaze, she won't drop the gaze. So I told the pastor, I said, Kenneth, who is she? He said, ask her. And so I am that guy. Oye, que tal? Quien eres? Hello, how's it going? Who are you? Here she comes. I thought, oh my God. I'll be a week before she gets across the room. (laughs) 
There's a reason she's 14 or 15 million years old. She don't get in a hurry for anyone. <laughs> she is so awesome. She, she comes there. She puts her, little, her hands. You can see through her skin. She puts her hands down. She's looking at me. She said, you know it's your fault? I said, probably. <laughs> she said, it is. I persecuted you diligently for 25 years. I said, so, you're one of the original persecutors. <laughs> she said, I am. I hated you when you came. She said, your clothes, your American smell, your... Your arrogance. Arrogance, dude. I, all I did was walk down the trail and seeing Jesus is king. Everybody's going to get saved and become subservient to me. I will domain this place. <laughs> I mean, what's arrogant about that? <laughs> she said, I got together with some witch doctors and some more powerful people. And we made a covenant that we would kill you. I said, well, you're not very good at your job. I said, I'm very healthy. I said, how did it go for you? She said, every one of us got sick and we fought diseases. And the more we paid money to have you kill, the more we got sick. I said, serves your right. Thank you for preaching the gospel for me. Attack me. This is what you get. She said, so one day, I was standing in the bushes with a gun, going to shoot you, and you were preaching. All of a sudden, this being came, walked right up to me. I said, being? Was it glowing? No. Was it? How did you? She said, I could see through it, but I could see it. And the being said to me, you must be born again. So I laid my gun down and walked in and got born again. And I said, whew, thank God these angels save me all the time and I don't even know it. She said, I went home, put my gun up, turned around, and the witch doctors and other people that I had made a pact with are in my house. And they said, we heard you got born again. Now, she just got, she just got home from church. She looked him right in the face. She said, yep, it was the being. He came, spoke to me in my dialect. They said, that's too bad. They tie her up in a chair, lit her house on fire. Went right out and cut all of her crops down, killed all of her animals. So you don't know this gospel. She's not even saved eight hours. And you think you need to mature before you engage the demon. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, I said, what happened? She said, as your God would have it, my son was by, and he ran in, picked me and chair and all up, and got out, and the thing burned down. Okay. I said, did the persecution stop? She said, it did not. It went on for five years. I said, till, till now. She said, yeah, it just stopped. I said, so the change has just happened. That's why all these officials are here. She said, it is. I said, do you have any idea what changed it? She said, I do. I said, inform me. I'm going to inform you now. Amen. Now, she was saved for five years, six years. And her goal 
she embarked on this goal the moment she got saved because she's the matriarch. Probably 250 people in, in her family. She told me my goal was every man, woman, and child in my family. I didn't have another goal. I didn't want another village. I wanted my family. I had preached to them for 25 years how to hate the gospel. And now I started preaching to them how to love the gospel. I said, are you successful? She says, I'm successful. There's no one left in my home. It, are, are you okay with this? Or? Yes. I mean, to me, it's a great story. Awesome. Verse 19, I will give you the keys. And it may not be some glowing angel with some manuscript with the blood of Jesus dripping off of it. With some explicit way to do things. It may, you may hear about the power of the enemy and it might rub you the wrong way and you might pick up your shofar and walk over to the corner of the house and blow and announce the coming of the king. Oh, yes. Yes. I said so. What is it that created the energy that I'm involved in right now? She said, you're the one that threw the pebble into the water and made the ripples. I said, I don't want any credit. I want to know why we've reached such grandeur, such great grace has been exhibited to us. Help me with that. She said, all right. She said, I'd been saved about five years, which that put it in my time frame, close to when I was there, like and I said, okay, so that's been like what? Two months? She said, three. I said, okay. All right. What happened? She said, I got sick. I normally go with some you don't know about this, but there's these chickens that have black skin, black blood, and you take these chickens and you go to the witch doctor and they do this blood rituals and and all sorts of stuff happens. All right. It's called black magic witchcraft. And so she said, normally I would do that, but I called my family in and we began to pray and fast. And then the second incurable came. The more we prayed, the rougher it got. And then it, it's at the end. I'm going to die. But I called all of my family together, all the heads of the houses, and I told them, all right, it's time for me to go now. Don't tell Brother David. You know, look at her. Like you think I'm not going to be interested in your death? I mean, what's up with you? <laughs> she said, no, that's not it. I'm 14 and a half million years old. <laughs> I'm ready to go. But really, it was a hundred. I'm ready to go. But I'm sick. And you won't let us go sick. <laughs> I said, it's illegal. You can't die sick. It's illegal. I'm all right with you dying because you've well lived out your 80 years. Move and make room for somebody else. <laughs> She said, I made my family promise <clears throat> that they wouldn't tell you. And my family told Brother David is going to get cross with us. You know him. He will fuss at us till we can't even look our heads up. <laughs> they, she said, you're right. But this last thing you're going to do for me. You can take it. Let him fuss. He'll end up loving you anyway. They go, you're right. Okay, we won't do it. So she died. But my, one of my pastors heard about the death. Now the, the jungle internet <laughs> is way faster than them little buttons you push. 
Because yours has to sit there and do them little <laughs> And theirs just keeps going, flowing like the river. It always flows. You can't stop it. So, my pastor rolls over there. He goes, was she sick when she died? <laughs> yes. Oh, you know this is going to bring Brother David and he'll dig that grave up. <laughs> Y'all know him. He just don't like this. They said, we know, but, but she made us, Mama made us promise. He said, oh, I didn't promise. <laughs> so he goes in there and he lays down and starts praying for us. Because where we are, you don't have a coroner come. There's no morgue. There's no nothing. You take their clothes they have on. You wash the body. You put on brand new clothes for them. And you put them in the house for a few hours so that the neighbors can come see them. And people, people pay their last respects. And then you go put them in the dirt. You have 24 hours, government rules. Helps avoid certain diseases in the jungle. And so, uh, she's laying in there, tendida, they call it. And the whole village came and put flowers and all this stuff. And uh, the pastor goes in there and he grabs her hand. She's dead now. <laughs> Jesus. And he's laying there. And all these people are doing their things. You got witch doctors coming. And you got these, these, these uh, religious people and idolatrous people coming and paying their respects. Because she's a very famous lady. Just a good person. Last, she's really a good person. She just needed Jesus, you know. And we got that done. So, And uh, now, I said, okay. Evidently... It worked, because you're standing here. I said, now, I can tell that you, because there's no way for me to describe to you the brightness. Her eyes were almost glowing. Now, you got this body that's decayed. It's old. But her eyes, if you, I'm telling you, I know she was with Jesus. I could see it. Her eyes were almost light bulbs. They weren't. But it was right before the actual brightness of glowing. And I'm looking at her. And she's just, she's rocking back and forth. I mean, this woman is on fire. I mean, she's millions of years old. <laughs> and I said to her, okay. You got my interest up. Why? Would God raise you? Look how old you are. For heaven's sakes, you're taking up space. It's not yours. You're breathing my air. It's not your air anymore. You've outlived your deal. <sighs> she said, it's not my fault. She said, when I died, I was released into peace, Brother David. I said, I know that feeling. I went there twice. <laughs> I've died twice. <laughs> And I said, what was, what was your environment? She said, because she's never left the village. You, that, you don't get that, but she's never seen a smartphone. She's never, she did see electricity, but no television, no, nothing. She's never drank water out of a faucet. She only drank it out of the spring. She dipped herself. And so, she, <laughs> this is awesome. I like her so much. She says, Brother David, I was walking down a trail. And it had lights. I said, what? <laughs> what kind of light? She said, I don't know. They were beautiful blue and white. And I said, where was the electricity coming from? She said, there were no cables. I said, why do you get it? You're, you have outlived your time taking up somebody else's air 
and you get special treatment even in death. What's up with you? <laughs> she says, thank you for showing me the trail of lights. I said, no problem. I said, I know you saw him. I know you did. I want to know about it. She says, okay. She says, I was walking and up in front of me, there were these spires of some kind of city. And they were gold. I said, what? You saw the city? Oh my God. So she's walking and she's coming over. The city's getting bigger and bigger. And it, it, she said, Brother David, I've never seen it. You didn't tell us about this. I said, I didn't know. <laughs> I said, I've got a shadow is what I've got. I don't know what reality looks like. She says, then let me explain. <laughs> I said, come on, mama, talk to papa. <laughs> she said, brother David, the people, the angels, beauty that I don't even know how, to, I don't have words to describe to you. I said, you were going. She said, I was, but I was interrupted by this being. I said, what? She said, the light is so intense in this city. But then a brighter light came. I said, I've heard about that. <laughs> what happened? She said, it rolled up on me and it stopped right in front of me. I'm almost to the city, but the light stopped me. And the curtain, the light was a curtain. You need to read uh, uh, Psalms 104. He puts on light as a garment. He, this curtain opened and then the bright light stepped out. She said, Brother David, it was way brighter. The brightest sun you've ever seen. This is way brighter. I said, who was it? She said, it was this man and he was way bigger than you. I said, okay. Did he tell you his name? She said, he didn't have to. You know who he is. His name is Light. I said, I do know him. His name is Jesus. I said, what happened? Now, what I'm fixing to tell you is not very scriptural. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry to you about your stuck in the mud theology and doctrine. <laughs> And I'm quite a conservative guy. You don't, it doesn't seem like it, but oh, God blows me out of the water every day, it seems like. Uh, I meet this presence and power and understanding that I didn't even know existed. Well, Jesus looked at her. He said, you didn't tell us. I said, I, I, if it's Jesus, I told you. She says, you told us about his eyes. I said, absolutely. Fire, right? She said, yes. But Brother David, I couldn't see nothing but the fire. I said, that's all I want to see. No. I want to see the fire. I want to see the glory of his presence. I want him revealed to us uninhibited, raw energy. And so... Oh, yeah, I better get a drink. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Talk about Jesus. You better be nervous. Oh, that's good. Made it myself. <laughs> Y'all then, Jesus looked at her and he reached in. She called it a dress. He had on a, a thing that men wear back, I don't know how long ago, but they still wear them except for here in this country. He reached in to his robe and pulled a, a, a light. It was in a glass case 
without, I don't know how it was stuck together. There was no wood or brass. It was just glass. And he looked at me. He handed it to me. And, and, and now she made a statement. She said, I've watched you in the prayer line. You stand like him. Wow. <laughs> and this is what you want. You want to be like your boss. And she... <laughs> it's so awesome. Woo! <laughs> and she said, I, I don't know why. I'm sorry, Brother David. But I just recently got the light. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> What was his reaction? He says, you can have it. I said, oh. He's, she said, then I thought, I don't have any money. And I looked at him and I said, sir, I cannot pay you for this light. And he looked at her. He said, the light of the gospel is free. I said, what'd you do? She said, I was looking at it. He said, it was emanating energy, but there was no source. I said, I want one. <laughs> I said, did he say anything else to you? She said, you know he did, don't you? I said, I do. What did he tell me? I know he said something. Because I've been watching you. You have a message. And it's from my boss. Now, what is it? <laughs> she said, Brother David, Jesus wanted me to tell you. <laughs> Old people talk so slow. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> she said, Brother David, Jesus said to tell you, he's coming soon. Hallelujah. Prepare the way of the Lord. So, she said, when he said that, I looked at my light, and the next thing I know, I was back, back in this old body, and I was raised up from the dead, and I looked at the pastor, and I slapped his hand, and I told him, I told you not to do this. He told her, I'd rather you slap me than Brother David fuss at me. Because I will. Our responsibility is to the life of the gospel. And that's the end of that. And so I said to her, what are you going to do now? She says, I have to go to the rest of the villages in my area. Some of the people are not wanting to repent. I must make them repent. I said, go girl. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah, they, yeah it's awesome. <clears throat> and because of her generosity and testimony it reached all of the officials in the government and so that's what all of this is about <laughs> did you hear me I just expressed to you 30 years of my life the first 15 to 18 years of my life in this area was persecution the next seven or eight was less persecution. And then the hammer fell and we owned the place. Yeah. I need you to be patient with your gospel.
I need you to be understanding with your gospel. I need you to understand who your God is and not... I can't let you be Burger King people. You go down to the slaughterhouse and buy you a calf and hand raise that calf, slaughter that calf, and grind your own hamburger. Understand the truth in what I'm saying. There are so many dead raisins that we're just finding out about. We don't even know. The mercy is so expansive. It's so great. And it was just a couple of kids heard God in Louisiana on a bayou and went. And, and it's, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. I left. No money. No backing. First nine years, I weighed less than I did when I left high school. You have no idea. But you look at me. What a privilege <laughs> to waste yourself away so that mercy can go to others. It's on purpose that I do this stuff. Don't you understand that? You're not going to talk sense into me. I am sensible. <laughs> so what do you need the keys? One verse and I'm going to stop. I have to go. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to, I don't remember what verse. Oh yeah. Thank you God. <laughs> It's Matthew, number 10, verse 7. Very famous. I preach this as much as possible. As you go, not sit in the river and worship. Come on. Oops. Back in the early 90s when the fire of God came and the river of the Lord swept through and the laughing and the breath of heaven and the wind Boy, it was awesome. It was refreshing. But people got stuck in that feed me and I'm a little bird and I'm worth it and all that. If God's mercy don't touch you, you're toast. I need you. You won't worship God more than I will in any given day. People ask me constantly, how, many, how much do you speak in tongues? It's somewhere between seven and nine hours a day. It, how much do you read the Bible? I listen to a hundred chapters plus every day of my life. You have to dedicate yourself to it for it to happen. It's not works. It's mercy. I work because I want to. I am driven. I'm possessed with finding him. Obtaining his favor. In your world it looks legalistic. It looks like I don't know about grace. You're foolish. Those harsh statements shouldn't be made. It just shows your immaturity. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Tell you a story right now on... Uh, Let's read this here first. It says, cure the sick. Verse 8. Raise the dead. Cleanse the leper. Drive out demons. Freely, without pay, you have received. Freely, without charge, give. You can ask this man over here. He asked me a lot to come here. And I, it's not that I don't want to. I like y'all. I like this place. Lots of things about it that I would be in if I could. Like Miss Heidi talks about the bath and the cheese. And that's great. I, I, I concur. <laughs> but I'm a soldier of the gospel. I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. It doesn't include my opinion. And I know that you believe that it does. 
or the world would have already been born again. And I'm not cursing you, I'll refuse. But I do know this. I bless you. <laughs> oh man. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Tell you how you get pastors. Can I tell you that? Because my job now is souls, of course. Healing, of course. But leadership is my deal now. <laughs> In a service, this is how you get pastors. I'm going to tell all of y'all. You believe you hire one from the best universities. I don't believe that. I believe God sends them to you and you raise them up. <laughs> Educated or not, doesn't matter. Education helps, but what matters is the will of God. So, missionary that I've been working with for 29 years, his name is Jeff Baker from Minnesota. He's up preaching there. They thought it was going to be me, but it wasn't. It was Jeff. They wanted me. They were some hired assassins come to church. You have no idea who's sitting in your midst. You think you know. You feel comfortable. You feel safe. You were wrong. In every service where I go and preach in Mexico, we have spies and assassins. Weird, huh? And these two assassins made up a plan. They're brothers. They're young boys. They're 18 years old. They decided they were paid already by the cartel to kill us. They have two knives each in their belt, filed on each side with feces on them. That's for the gangrene. And they know that we're going to call for souls. And they know we're going to lift our hands and pray. And the plan is when the hands go up, the knives come out and both of them hit us. Boom. That's the plan. So according to plan, we're on schedule. They walk up like they're getting saved. We are there and we preach the gospel and we're, people are getting saved. So we lift our, Jeff Baker lifts his hands. They put their hands behind their back. They pull their knives. And when he said, Jesus bless them. The fire of God hit everybody. Including the assassins. They're knocked out on the floor. And when they woke up, they're speaking in tongues. And they're not, they're assassins. They are assassins. But that's not who God sees. God sees kings and sons. God sees pastors. <laughs> and he asked them, what are you doing? They couldn't talk to him. They were, they were speaking in tongues. And it turns out that both of these boys got so radically saved... One of them now is one of my main directors of 12 directors. He runs about 80 or 90 of our churches. This assassin. His brother works for him like he did in the assassin field. And he now runs five of our churches. The old thing, remember? You don't judge a book by its cover. Because the last chapter is not written yet. We got this. I bless you. Would you please stand? I need three or four of y'all to pray over right here over these things. Three or four on this side. Pray over these things. I'm going to put you to work. Let's go. Right here. Lay your hands upon these things in Jesus' name. Come down. We're going to do impartation, but I'm not going to lay hands on you. Uh, 
I honestly, I've got to drive to Western Maryland. I bless you. Do you hear me? But you see me, I'm not rushing. You see me not rushing? I'm taking my time on purpose with you. I bless you. In the name of the Lord, the giver of lights, the maker of heaven and earth, is interested in us. And I want you to receive this energy, this life, this healing, this health. Holy Ghost, fire on these items in Jesus' name. Fire on the sons of God. Fire of the Lord. Shoka Baba. Thank y'all. Thank you, fellas. Thank y'all. Everybody's important. All of us. Jobs the same. Be blessed, eh? Holy Ghost. Shote kataba baba basha taba. Tarabobo sha tarababa sha te kataraba baba hatane.